and welcome to Fact Schmacks. It's the podcast good enough to get you a C. Minus. My name's Matt, and I've got a story to tell. My name's Kev. I have a story to interrupt. <laughs> Kevin. Matthew. Did you know... If that's your that real name. L- It is. Okay. Did you know that Latin for good enough is, is satis? Factory? <laughs> nope. Just satis. Just satis. Good enough. That's the saddest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. That's so lazy. <laughs> It is lazy. <laughs> or I don't know. Maybe we maybe we're tryhards. We really had to spruce spruce it up. Like they had it good enough and we gotta be like we gotta add a whole ass factory on the back end of that thing. Perhaps. Maybe on our logo we instead of saying uh meh good enough, we'll say meh status. Yeah. I think maybe maybe a change is in order. Who knows? Perhaps changes in the air. Well, speaking of facts, what do you got for me, Kev? Well, I've got some fun band name facts for you. Oh. So like kind of like where did the band get the origin, uh, the, you know, the idea for the band name? Like, you know, Leonard Skinner uh, was a yeah. gym teacher. I did not know that. Yeah. Leonard Skinner was a gym teacher in the band. Like they'd gone to high school and it was like their high school gym teacher. So they named their band Leonard Skinner. Okay. Uh, so factor schmacked, Matt. Yes. Sepultura. Easy mm-hmm. answer here. Sepultura means grave in Portuguese. But oh. the story is even better. Frontman okay. Max Cavalera came up with a word while translating the lyrics to Motorhead's Dancing on Your Grave into Portuguese. Okay. So Motorhead inspired means Came up grave. with the word? So I thought he, you said he, it was an existing word. Yeah, like came up with the word while translating. So he was translating into Portuguese. And then he's like, oh, sepultura is the word for grave. That's an awesome word. Sounds like he didn't come up with it at all. Well, some of these are just supposed to be fun and informative. <laughs> <laughs> Continue, sometimes please. I just want to entertain. Didi Ramon took the name Ramones as a moniker after learning that Paul McCartney would check into hotels under a fake name, Paul Ramon. Oh, interesting. Well, that's that's something that if it's true, uh, uh, our, our producers are going to right away. Matt, ah! 21 Pilots. <laughs> <laughs> While a positive and upbeat band for the most part, the name 21 Pilots actually carries a somewhat sinister meaning. 21 Pilots is a reference to a 1997 Norwegian air disaster where a plane shuttling 21 pilots from Germany to Switzerland crashed into the Alps due to a combination of bad weather and faulty instrumentation. Interesting. Yes, TikTok, uh, my friend. Interesting. God, bad weather. 21 Pilots. I'm going to say that's the 21 Pilots one is the schmacked. Yeah. Me out. That wasn't a very <laughs> hard one at all. Uh, but actually, actually, so the origin of the name 21 Pilots is a reference to All My Sons, a play by Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman author, of course. In yes. it, the main character allows a series of planes to take off, even though he knows they contain faulty parts, costing 21 pilots their lives. Oh. Give me a damn story. I'm going to make it harder right. for you next week. That I promise. Okay. <laughs> no more wins for you. Uh, okay. Uh, we have we have we've kind of stopped keeping score, which is nice. I didn't I didn't never liked keeping score because a oh, it was hard to keep track of, and b I just do it for the love of the game. Kind of like how I did it to inform and entertain. <laughs> no, this is straight up competition. <laughs> you rhymed there. Uh, convenient. Uh, and while. Uh, With silent lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Uh, That is uh, from uh, a poem. Uh, The poem is High Flight by John Gillespie. You know, I like to start these things off with a little quote John Gillespie was my neighbor. Well, well, well. Like the guy who actually wrote that? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know if you wrote. I was like nine when they moved away. But <laughs> okay. my neighbor's name Probably was John guy. Gillespie. That's hilarious. 
unlikely to be the same guy. He looks like Rand say. Smolnik from the Blue Jays. I don't know. That's All a right. bit of a lofty uh, <laughs> reference, but that was true. We went to a Blue Jays game with him, and everyone was like, whoa, it's Rand Smolnik and his kids. It's like, no, man. Lofty. Very yeah. nice. Very. Right. Carry on. <clears throat> well, it's the evening of July 4th, 1928. And Lieutenant Marquet of the French 1st Battalion. Sorry, what's his name? Marquet. What was his rank? Lieutenant. Okay. Sounded like you said that funny for a sec. Hey, I'm carry on. Sorry. I'm carry. sorry. Uh, of the French 1st Battalion. He's confused. You see, he's in charge of a beach. He's in, he's in charge of a fort, really. The fort's called Far- Fort Mardic. <laughs> he said fart. Fart? <laughs> I did say fart that time. <laughs> Uh, but a beach is part of this, uh, this fort. It's right outside Dunkirk, actually. Uh, and a plane just landed on his beach unexpectedly. This is a surprise plane, which historically surprise planes have been the worst kind of plane. Right. Now, out of this plane climb six people. There's Fred Baxter, Arthur Hodgson, Eileen Clark. Paula Bidelon, Donna Drew, or sorry, Donald Drew, uh, and Robert Little. Uh, and these people are all in obvious stress or distress. We will see. So he sends his, uh, you know, his troops out and he rounds these six folks up and he starts asking them questions. You know, like, who are you? What are you doing here? Whose plane is that? Sort of reasonable questions you might ask when somebody lands uh, a Fokker trimotor. Uh, on your beach. So like I said, these people are in pretty obvious distress. So these are very they, English names coming out of a German plane? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe, it's, maybe it was just a German-engineered plane, I guess. It is a German plane, <clears throat> yes. A German-engineered okay. plane. Um, you know, we'll get to uh, the nationalities of, uh, of the important players uh, okay. when we get there. Um, now, like I said, they're they're in obvious distress. They say that uh, you know they they are um, employed by the owner of the plane, uh, who is not with them because he disappeared from the plane. Um, now they would not reveal who their boss was, oh. at least not initially. Um, you got Paula Bidelon and Eileen Clark, uh, the two ladies there. They were noted to have been crying. Arthur Hodgson was said to have been sweating excessively, and Fred Baxton's teeth were chattering incessantly. But after half an hour of being interrogated and questioned... There was four uh, of them or six? Six. Six, Not yeah. no, um, no real um, Comment notable on the other reports two. of how, yeah, <laughs> the, how other the other two, two were like, behaving. Oh, yeah, but we're these good. four in particular were noted to be behaving somewhat suspiciously anyways not sus- you know i don't know about suspicious but they were behaving notably like they were quite uh, of stressed note. out yeah you yes. kind of say uh, it's a little peculiar so after a half an hour they finally revealed the name of their employer alfred lowenstein so who the dun, hell is dun, alfred dun, lowenstein uh, i'd like to know right where'd he go alfred Alfred Leonard Lowenstein was born in Brussels on the 11th of March, uh, 1877. His father was a banker, and Al followed in his footsteps, establishing his own banking concern, which is a very fancy way of saying guy who lends money uh, and who collects interest to lend other people money or, you know, basically a bank. He kind of became his own bank. Uh, And he became very wealthy by the age of 37 in 1914. Good for him. Good for him. Uh, he turned uh, that uh, existing success into greater success by being an early investor in electricity. So he made a ton of money. Uh, and the, uh, in his heyday in the 1920s, he was worth about 12 million pounds, which is about half a billion pounds in 2022 dollars. Wow. Which is a lot of money. Uh, That's a that lot That would have been cheddar. It was a lot of cheddar. It made him at one point the third richest man in the world. Huh. Yeah. How come I never heard of him? I guess that's a long well, time ago. That is a long time ago. Lots happened since then. But what's life without love? Well, old Al had something he loved besides money. Besides money, sorry. His horses. 
He uh, he bred racehorses, one of whom, Easter Hero, was even a champion. And uh, yeah, he had a wife, too, Madeline. They slept in separate beds, and it very much seemed like the sort of thing where she enjoyed having a very nice lifestyle, and he enjoyed having a nice-looking wife. But, uh, man, those horses, he really loved his... Uh, his horses, his hooved friends. Okay. It's kind of weird, but carry on. Yeah. I, f- I feel like yeah, that's going to connect somewhere down the line. It actually doesn't necessarily. Uh, uh, just I'm like wrong. a character detail about him. Uh, now, <clears throat> as a big famous businessman, he made his share of enemies, a lot of whom apparently, uh, um, sorry, a lot of them apparently. But he also had friends, allegedly friends like Arnold the Brain Rothstein, who is a legitimate businessman in New York City, dabbling in such legitimate businesses like racketeering, drug dealing, and fixing major sporting events. Wait, 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 wait. Those don't sound like legitimate businesses. (laughs) Those sound like illegitimate businesses. I can't get anything by you. Sounds Um, like some mafia shit there. This actually will absolutely not necessarily come up later, but it's interesting that he was, you know, close with the New York mobster. Uh, and it was alleged that he was involved in some level of opiate dealing himself, but that nothing okay. ever came of that rumor. It was just sort of, uh, you know, sort of what the chattering class were saying, as they say. Okay. So it was that on July it was, 4th. Sorry, it was, you could say that it was alleged. It was alleged. Allegedly. Yes. Allegedly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, you know, and, and, <clears throat> You know, maybe it just as an aside, this is going to veer pretty close into true crime territory. So every a lot of stuff is allegedly. Okay, I like that. It's a little different. Mm. Yeah, we've dabbled, but never you know. We've dabbled. Far. We might be getting doing more stuff sort of like this in the future, but you sure. know, it's a mystery. Choosy. It's a mystery. A, a history mystery. A history. That's right. Uh, so it was that on July fourth, nineteen twenty eight, two limos rolled up to the Crichton Airport. Uh, and uh, stopped in front of a Fokker Trimotor private airplane. Seven people get out, Alfred Lowenstein, uh, Fred Baxter, who's his valet, Arthur Hodgson, his secretary. Now we're figuring out who these people are, right? Uh, Eileen, Cl- uh, Eileen uh, oh, I've clearly misspelled this. <laughs> I have to go back a slide to figure out what her name is. <laughs> <laughs> we're just bringing the best quality podcast season two. Oh, my two. God. There it is, Eileen <laughs> Clark and Paul and Pidelod, both what did, his what did you have it spelled as? Clard. Clard. <laughs> and I panicked in the moment and couldn't figure it out. <laughs> both uh, stenographers and uh, Donald Drew, the pilot, Robert Little, the mechanic. They all get out. Uh, the only leg- irregularity on their way into the plane is that apparently Lowenstein called a business associate of his from the airport to arrange a dinner the next week. Uh, then they boarded the plane, and Lowenstein was seen waving from the window of the plane to the commoners who were apparently watching him uh, take off. As oh, yeah, because uh, flight I guess... was a big thing back then, right? I mean, it was only in its infancy. Like, when did uh, Kitty Hawk was only early 1900s? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess say like 1909, and they were gonna they were gonna fly um, over the channel to Brussels, and that's so you know, yeah, that's I don't know how long you would have been able to do that for, um, but uh, it would have been a pretty you know pretty luxurious thing. Oh yeah, that would have been huge. I mean, obviously they had planes during World War One. Yeah, hold on, not I, great. I, but I want to I want to just give a. <clears throat> We're you go making ahead. fantastic <laughs> you go ahead. here. Anyways. I just I just want to give a date for the first flight, but that's uh, sure. Know, I forget. Uh, inside the plane, uh, according to those on board, things were going uh, very routinely until a little after takeoff, when the plane was over the English Channel. Apparently, Alfred uh, stood up and moved to the rear of the plane, where there was a bathroom. Uh, no word on whether the plan was for a number one or a number two. Now, a little bit on the layout of this plane. Uh, it's a 50-foot-long plane with three prop motors, one on each wing and one on the nose, being a tri-motor. Uh, it's the 1920s equivalent of a private <laughs> jet, featured an unpressurized cabin, um, so behind, which was situated behind the cockpit, which also would have been unpressurized. Uh, and then there's a third section behind that cabin 
in the back containing a small bathroom on one side and the exit door on the other. Now, since the whole thing wasn't pressurized, it was loud in the cabin. Apparently, there had been steps taken on this particular plane to try and make it a little quieter because he liked to work while he was on his plane. Like yeah. to, you know, be able to uh, dictate and oh, whatnot. So There's really only so much you can do. The whole plane was not pressurized or part of it was. No, none of it was none pressurized. Of it was I'm pressurized. just kind of reemphasizing so you that couldn't in go this day like and age, super high. No... Exactly. So this yeah. thing's flying at 4,000 feet. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as flight goes, uh, December 17th, 1903 was the first flight. Yeah, so and we're... Less than 12 seconds. From 12 seconds to private jets that... Or private... Not jets, private plane. Yeah. Uh, that can fly over the the channel is is pretty cool. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Um, So anyways, Alfred stood up and he hit the can. And after 15 or 20 minutes or so, uh, you know, the the folks in the cabin noticed he'd been gone for a while. Maybe he's not feeling well, you know. It didn't take that long to fly over the channel. So uh, Fred Baxter wound up going to the back to see if everything was okay. He gets back there and he knocks on the door of the latrine and he gets no response. Maybe they called it the privy. Maybe they did. Let's go with Privy. I like that. Uh, So he knocks again. No response. Works up the courage. Finally, he just opens the door, and he finds the bathroom empty. Lowenstein's nowhere to be found. And it's apparently then that he noticed the exit door was flapping in the wind. Anyways, Baxter goes, runs to the front of the plane, into the uh, cockpit, and tries to inform the pilot. Pilot's apparently unable to hear him. So he uh, has to write a note that says captain's gone or something like that. And he flashes it in front of the face of the the pilot. Now, apparently at this point, from from what I can gather from the timeline, they are over the channel at this point. They are most of the way to their destination, which is an airport in Brussels. Uh, But at that point, they circle back and they land on a beach in France, uh, which happened to be just outside of uh, Dunkirk, sorry. And... uh, Hence, end up captives of the French army. So, once the cat's out of the bag, that the world's third richest man, uh, sorry, world's third richest man, had apparently Mr. Magood his way out of an airplane, uh, you know, word got around fast. Press is all over it, but in a weird way, they're like, you know, nobody in his immediate circle seems to really care all that much. Uh, his wife, Madeline, Seems to only really care about getting her money out of, uh, you know, out of the estate. She's trying to get the estate process started, but she can't because there's not a body and nobody's really 100% sure if he's actually dead. So her absent anything else happening, she would have to wait like seven years. So, you know, uh, what she did was offer a reward for anyone who found the body. In the pantheon of or pantheon of good marriages, I get the feeling this one does not feature. No, um, I don't think so. There were rumors reported in the press, apparently, of someone seeing a guy parachuting uh, in the area and someone else seeing a boat in the area. Lots of hearsay and innuendo, but nothing really coming out of it. It's so like he DB Coopered his way out of a Fokker. <laughs> Who knows? Well, or did he DB Cooper his way out of a Fokker? We'll get into that. So the six passengers, they're shoved in front of a Belgian judge for an inquiry, and they present their side of the story, you know, pretty much what they, what I had just gone over. They, you know, go to the back, find the door f- flapping open. The, uh, the, the mechanic and the pilot say that when they were flying that plane, you know, because this, this is a few days later, they, were fl- they flew the plane back to England. And when they did it, they took turns and went to the back and were able to open and close the door easily. So the judge, lacking uh, any other uh, any other information, just kind of went with it. So the official finding of that inquiry was essentially death by misadventure. Uh, he just basically walked out of the bathroom or maybe never made it to the bathroom, turned right instead of left. Um, so this is daytime? His, uh, no, nighttime. This was nighttime. This and was they, nighttime. They landed on a beach at night or yeah. at dawn? I don't necessarily know because I couldn't find exact time frames. It might have been dawn by the time they landed. I don't think so because it wasn't. It wouldn't have been a very long flight. That to me 
seems weird because you're landing a plane on a beach in the middle of the night. Like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was uh, the morning by the beach, time they landed. I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be hard to see, and who knows what's on the beach. I mean, that's a very precarious thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it must not have been. It must have been the day or the morning. I was going to say daytime, if that thing's got a window on it, surely to God, you know that's not where the bathroom is. Also, that it, it would did. be on the exterior of the plane. Right. It did have a window, and the bathroom door did not, right, for obvious reasons. Sure. It would be. <laughs> kind of you don't put a window on the privy. <laughs> 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 Anyways. <laughs> oh, the shenanigans that would happen. Um so, yeah, that that was their finding, that he basically at one point just opened the wrong door and walked right out of the plane, like somebody walking into an elevator shaft. And that's, uh, yeah. The aviation uh, industry, on the other hand, uh, was not convinced. Uh, they said that this would be the first time that anybody would have ever made such a mistake, uh, and nobody was sure that it was even possible to open that door mid-flight. Um, there was a colonel who told the Toronto Daily Mail... That, uh, you know, you A, everybody on the plane would know the second the door was opened, and B, as soon as you got it open a crack, um, because of the, you know, pressure trying to equalize, it would slam right shut. Right. Um, there was a, the, or sorry, the, the plane door was examined by the chief inspector of the UK Air Ministry and found to be in perfect working order. Uh, Norman W. Ray, a reporter, took a similar plane up a thousand feet in the air and did his absolute damnedest to get the door open mid-flight. He couldn't get the thing to budge using all of his might, and apparently he went so far as to take as, as much of a run at the door as he could. He got it to open about three inches, and then it slammed shut. Oh my god, can you imagine testing that thing? <laughs> I'm going to run at this no. door... I have to imagine he had a harness on that wouldn't have let him get too far <laughs> away, but, like, man, the ball's on that guy. That would have looked pretty funny. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's it seems like it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for a single person to have opened that door if it was a proper door. Like, now, oh, sorry. Looking at this um, plane, I think of like the kind of transport planes that they would have almost World War II era. Yeah. But that's not what this is. It's a little bit bigger. Mm. Or maybe not a little bit bigger, but it's. I'd say if anything, it's it almost is like, like, I don't even. Could you stand up in it? Doesn't um, seem that like that big of a plane. Like it's, oh, sorry. Did you see World War Two era transport? I'm picturing like a World War Two era transport, like the sorry, small like yeah. dozen people that can get onto it. Yeah, but I'm Yo, looking yeah, a at, little bit smaller than that. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at a picture of what right now. Trying or I don't to get know. Maybe if you head. ripped out, maybe if you ripped out the latrine. It's hard to see because in these pictures that I'm looking at, there's no person for scale. But I, I'm. Do you wondering, see, it's like wicker chairs in there. Yeah. But I'm just I'm trying to picture <laughs> it looks like, like there's lawn chairs set like up. There's in a it. there's a bathroom back there and shit. Like a, it's weird to picture, but I yeah, guess next it looks, to a, yeah, maybe it is pretty big next to a vehicle there. Yeah. It's it just, just doesn't look like it looks like a big small plane. That's yeah, it looks like a big small it looks like a like a big not Cessna, but like that kind of like you know. Yeah, because the, any plane that's designed like that that you see now is smaller, so that w- when you see it, yeah. you transpose it in your mind. Yeah, but yeah, it there's seems like, like it, a small plane to you, but I guess it wouldn't be. It would be. Yeah, it fits big. seven or eight people comfortably. Yeah, you can see the um, windows on the side. I'm sure that uh, by the time that I do the uh, little episode artwork, there will be a picture of it on there if you. I don't think the episode artwork shows up in, in Apple, but uh, everywhere else you should be able to see that. Yeah, I'll try, try and, and put figure a, out a way to get the podcast uh, notes or something. Get a no, link. no, yeah, no, I will. I, I have a little pad of paper here. Uh, we're gonna link, link the Fokker, <laughs> link that, <laughs> link that Fokker, link that Fokker. Ah, ding, ding, ding! I was waiting for a Fokker joke. <laughs> <laughs> Check the notes for the Fokker link. All right, carry on. Now on uh, July nineteenth. Um, 
the uh, a body is found by some fishermen. Uh, it's identified as the body of Lowenstein by the personalized wristwatch still attached to attached to his wrist of all places. Um, his wife ordered a private autopsy be done. It of took two two months for that to happen. Apparently, I don't know if that's a long time for the standards of the day, but it seems like it would be uh, for now. But that. That is what went down. Came back that he'd broken every bone in his body, but had been alive when he'd hit the water, which is he drowned. a horrifying thought. Um, and uh, also, uh, he'd had some alcohol in his system, which is was apparently odd for him, as he was a teetotaler, which, uh, as you may know, is somebody who does not drink. Okay. Now, Madeline had him buried in an unmarked grave, and seemed to move on with her life pretty quickly. She, in fact, did not even attend the funeral. Uh, and the case really was never picked up by anybody because it happened midair between countries. You know, they landed in France. He was Belgian. They left from England. They all kind of like looked at each other and went, oh, if someone else wants to do something about it. Uh, so that's kind of how things were left. So now we get into the theories. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so <clears throat> have you developed a personal theory yourself? I've got I've got some I the yeah, I've got one that I favor above the others. All right, I'm gonna see if it if it lines up with what I'm thinking. All right. So what the hell happened here, right? The first theory we look Dude. at is uh the null hypothesis, which was he was clumsy and just simply went through the wrong door. Uh, his wife and business associates said he had been getting increasingly absent-minded lately, but the whole, like, doors almost impossible for a single person to open makes me, makes it hard for me to believe that he just, you know, did that by accident. Um, yeah, I, what do you think about the accidental hypothesis? I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to think of a, I mean, if you got disoriented, if you were inebriated, or if you were maybe like this guy's older, how old is this guy when he dies? Uh, he is in his 50s, like 50. Let me see that's that's awfully young for, I would think, awfully young for uh, Alzheimer, dementia. Uh, yeah. There's that thing called sundowners where it's like a nighttime disorientation people get. I don't okay. Know if you're familiar with that because I asked him day not. or night. Uh, it's kind of weird to me to think that you would just step out of a plane. I think, I think when you're on a plane, if you're like me, you, you gotta be pretty cognizant of, Hey, I'm on a plane yeah. and everywhere inside the plane is not in the plane. <laughs> That's not good. Were there, uh, yeah. now did they have parachutes on these planes? Like, uh, you would have life preservers on a lifeboat. God. Such a great question. I don't think with the, <laughs> the fact the door is so damn hard to open, I don't know. Um, great question. Uh, yeah. I'd feel a lot better about flying in a commercial airliner if they had parachutes, like under yeah, the seat. They've they looked into like, it, and it's just not feasible. Like everyone gets sucked into the jet engines. What? Now, although give me give me the choice between uh, going down with the plane or just jumping into the jet engine, I'm not sure which I'd pick. Dude, I mean, you could jump out the back, DB Cooper style. Uh, maybe. Did you? When did you look into this? How do you know that? That's an interesting fact. Is this part of your paranoia for travel? Um, <laughs> you looked at. You're like, can I get a parachute on a seven forty seven? No, I just. I at some point I just learned that like our, I don't know, in some sort of like why don't why is news article why isn't there parachutes <clears> on. <throat> commercial planes and the, the oh, answer was okay. basically they looked into it and it's very hard to coordinate people and teach them how to parachute and it's unclear if the um, outcomes would be any better dude i would 100 percent rather take the parachute anyhow absolutely uh i don't absolutely. really buy the whole accidental thing it seems no. to me just too too hard to actually pull off and like if you open a door thinking that you're either going to the shitter or you're going back to the cabin and all of a sudden you're hit with like, I don't know what the wind speed would be up there, but it'd be amount of yeah, I'd be like, uh, yeah, I'd be like, Have Oh, that's the, the wrong door. 
Have you ever seen I Think You Should Leave? It's a oh no, of course you don't. You don't like comedy. Uh, but what? There's a what does the, that mean? The opening. Yeah, you just don't like comedy. Uh, I like comedy. You don't like sketch comedy. I should no, say. Sorry, I don't like sketch comedy. Yeah, the the opening bit is the guy just like finishing up a, a job interview, and he goes to <laughs> to leave, and the doors clearly you're supposed to push it, but he pulls on it by accident. And the guy who's who was doing the interview with, for him says, "Oh, I think you were supposed to push it." And he goes. He like insists no, it goes both ways, and the whole thing is him just doing this absolute Herculean effort to just break the door and pull it the opposite way. There's <laughs> like spit coming out of his mouth. <laughs> he's just locking eyes with the guy the whole time. <laughs> Finally, it breaks and opens, and he's okay. See you later. <laughs> like that's what it would be like <laughs> right. to try and get that open. Right? Like it, yeah, it, I just don't. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I want to hear more <laughs> about this mob stuff. Uh, Am I getting ahead well, of us? Yeah. So there, right. there are some people who uh, think that he may have taken his own life because um, because apparently you know people are talking about this mob connection. He, and also people said his his business life was more complicated than he let on because he had some debt. But I think like having debt is just the way those people operate. Like, sure, they leverage assets, take on debt. You know, Elon Musk is. How rich, and he has how much debt for you know to buy Twitter? What's his actual cash flow, right? Like, yeah, how much could he pull uh, out of the bank right now? Yeah, so some Probably people have said maybe he, uh, maybe he did that. I again, I you have the same problem though that you can't open the door. So unless he had the people on the plane help him open the door, which is a morbid thing to ask people, you know, there's easier ways to do it. Yeah. And I have to get six people close to you to volunteer. Four people, I guess, close to you and two pilots. Yeah. Or at least, I don't know, one, like maybe, you know, the guy who goes to check on him, Fred Baxter, he's really going to help him open the door. But I don't buy that. No. Don't buy it for a second, frankly. No. No. And to know that, you'd have to have tried it once. Yep. Yeah, I I don't buy it. I don't buy it. There's a lot of holes in that. It's like the Swiss cheese of theories. Yep. No, there's there's two scenarios that are likely, in my opinion. And the first one just falls into a bucket. Murder. Murder. Most foul. Okay, now what's let's, the deal here? Let's say, well, there's, and like I said, this is kind of a bucket, because you can break this down. Do the people inside the plane know? There's maybe a way where they don't know. We were talking about parachutes and some guy who was seen parachuting. Let's say maybe sure, yeah, somebody let's talk was about that. Let's That's talk a rare about thing this. for the day. Yeah, maybe somebody was already hiding on that plane. Maybe somebody was already on the plane before they took off. And maybe when Lowenstein went to go to the bathroom, mm, I don't like this theory at all because it it's, sounds dumb. There's, there's too much riding on him going being to the, the bathroom, first one to right? go to the bathroom. Yeah. Being, now maybe they you know they found alcohol in the system so maybe I don't know they spiked a drink or something hoping that he would he nah, wouldn't feel well. Nah, that's a terrible plot for murder. That's the worst plot. Like that's It's Columbo like complicated <laughs> not even man. That's the most complicated convoluted murder. Like just shoot the guy. I'm going to put some <laughs> I'm going to put some booze in his in his tea. To make sure that he has to go pee pee on the plane, and then I'm going right. to pull him out, and it's not it's stupid. Yeah, how many times are you terrible. waiting on that plane? How many how many flights you've been on hoping uh, that he's the first one that takes a tinkle? So the idea is that he goes out with with uh, you know uses some sort of special tool to open the door, goes out with Lowenstein. He's got a parachute. Lowenstein doesn't. That's Bob's your te- uncle. Uh, terrible, terrible theory. Terrible. 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 The more likely thing is that the people who were in the plane, not more likely, but if it is murder, the more likely thing is the people on the plane were involved in some way. It's hard to nobody get ever conf- that. Nobody ever confessed? Nobody ever confessed. I don't there was, for um, minute believe that. Oh, there was the, uh, the, what, the what, either the pilot or the mechanic said at one point they, and this goes to the alcohol thing, that, that when he went up to go to the bathroom, like, he just looked out of it like he stood up and he took off his jacket and his tie. Like, I don't know. But as, as I saw someone else point out, like, I don't know, maybe he was going to have 
the deuce of his life and just knew that he had to loosen up. Uh, you know what? That's you don't know. Bring you can't. Me, that, that actually makes me think of like a very kind of dark fact, uh, which would bring us to probably our next theory is suicide. Oh, we already went over we, suicide. Yeah, we went over suicide, but like that, that brings me back to that because one of the things that I, I heard somewhere and – uh, I, f- I found it really morbid is that a lot of times people when they commit suicide will actually undress down to their underwear. It's a thing about just being comfortable before you die. And that would also sure. kind of explain the booze because maybe he needed to just have the courage so he had some drinks. Maybe. But once again, there's easier ways to do it, but... Maybe, you know, he hated his wife and thought, well, if there's no body, she gets no money and everything's a win. Now, there is, there is a theory because there's, there's a lot that goes into this, right? There's a lot. Why did the pilot theory. turn around and land on the beach in the first place when yeah, he, he might yeah, have yeah, even yeah. been closer to the airport than the beach? Okay. Was it that there was something they needed to do or ditch without being seen or at least before anybody saw them? One theory is that there was a false door, that they swapped the door with one that was broken, and then when they landed somewhere, they swapped it back. Makes Uh, it just easier to push them out. I don't know. I still don't buy it. Or that they took the door right off and had to reattach it before anyone saw them. uh, I don't buy it. It's the whole thing is weird, right? That would maybe explain, you know, the chattering teeth and all that. Cause it would maybe get that much colder. But I mean, these things aren't pressurized to begin with. They're at 4,000 feet. It's yeah. May at night. So it's cold. So these people yeah. are probably dressed for the elements. But I don't think the skin of that uh, thing would make much difference between uh, the door open and door closed. I mean, we're not yeah. talking about, we're talking about a couple degrees. Maybe it is a lot, but I don't see it being that much colder. Uh, now, what if? I don't know. This is weird. This is a weird one. Right? Where'd every you find which, this? Uh, every which way you yeah, look at nice. it, none of it really adds up, right? No. Now, one thing that doesn't add up to me is that his body was identified based on his wristwatch. Sure. And he never drank. Okay. Is anybody sure? It's not like they identified it based on DNA, DNA or yeah, dental yeah, records. Yeah. Is anybody sure that he really died? And didn't here's think the death. thing, my friend. I think it is a whole lot easier to pay people to keep the sort of secret where this guy's really dead or this guy's really alive. You know, okay. I think it's easier to pay to keep that sort of secret. Now, the thing that gets in the way of that theory is whoever landed in the water was alive when they landed, right? Okay, so you're gonna fake your death, right? Fake your death, but you have to murder somebody in the process, or you find somebody who's already dead. But that's and that's the thing; it was or, a private autopsy, so it could have been, uh, or the autopsy the could have been made to fit. The narrative, but because it was a private autopsy. Make, but then, why add the alcohol thing? Plausible, uh, like a plausible uh, reason for why he might have had the misstep or the mistake, or possibly to kind of suggest something like a suicide. Or is that a character? Just, there is no explanation that f- that perfectly fits every bit of evidence. In this my is opinion, a true history's mystery. This is a history's mystery. I personally, if I'm going to put my money on anything, it's going to be that he faked his own death. That really, yeah, I think it let he, I don't know, the wife got what they want, maybe. So what does he do? He fakes his death and then he just, what, uh, goes on to live as a pauper in Belgium with no money? Like, No, he probably doesn't go to Belgium. He probably takes enough money to live like a king in Tahiti. Okay. So rolling back to our old mafia friend here. What do you think? 
Uh, excuse me. Uh, I gotta. I kind of lean. That's what we have our fancy cough buttons for, Kevin. I know, I dude. It's my first time using it. I forgot to use it. <laughs> I've used it a few times. I'm gonna shame and, you. And uh, yeah, whatever it happens. Uh, so I lean towards either suicide or the uh, fake a death situation. Now, now, if it's suicide, how does he get the door open? I don't know, man. They must have, you must have been able to open these doors. Apparently, it was impossible for one person to do. I mean, that would be a lot. I mean, imagine trying because to open the- your car door on the highway. Well, but you're, you know, going faster than that. Exactly, that's and there what is I mean. even if you're unpressurized, like there still would be a pref, uh, a pressure differential if because you'd be right in the the um, the slipstream of the yeah, propellers. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That's how wings yeah. work, man. There's a di- pressure difference between the top and bottom of the wing by that because of the airflow. Yeah, so you're right behind that. So apparently, it's the strips. The slipstream would force the door close as soon as you opened it. So I almost think the only way it could happen is if you took the door right off. I don't know. That's weird, man. It's definitely, it's very thought provoking. And it's kind of one of those things where it's a cool story. uh, And I'm interesting. uh, I'm interested to to learn more about it and stuff. But it almost sucks sometimes that there's no like answer. You know, it's like. (laughs) I would love to know. Yeah, it would be great to uh, to know. Like, it, you know, the DB Kev Cooper just made one. A very, very big show of coughing with his little clear, with his mute button on. Clear my throat. Well, I did yeah. listen. I listened back to our uh, our Headless Valley uh, episode about the Nahani, and I did clear my throat an awful lot. I was just getting over COVID when we recorded that, so it was yeah, a pretty rough episode. <laughs> I just roll out a little apology. We have very nice little uh, mute buttons now to. To stop that from happening. You basically, uh, you cleared your throat like it was a comma. You could, you could basically make a drinking game out of it and you'd be shittered by the end of it. But it's, oh. it's a cool story though. I still stand by that be story being pretty five cool. minutes. Yeah. Hey man, it was COVID. Strange times. I was very sick. Very, very sick that week. Yeah. And, Sickest and- I've ever been in my life. And we're so grateful that you're all better. I don't know what I'd do without you. You're my special guy. <laughs> well, Matt, uh, I mean, I'd love to hear what people think. Uh, if anybody's uh, active on the Facebook or the Twitter, give us a shout and let us know what your theory is because I'd, I'd like to hear what different people think about this because, uh, like, I lean towards the suicide or fake death. I don't – it doesn't sound like murder to me. Uh, it sounds like he was trying to maybe get away from some bad business shit, bad marriage, but I don't know, yeah, man, a 50 something year old millionaire jumping out of a plane in the dark in the English channel. How do you guarantee that you're going to land? I don't see him escaping DB Cooper style out of a plane. That's too far. I don't think, uh, I don't think a rich businessman is going to do that. Yeah. I don't see that. Th- the whole none of it makes sense to me. No, it's compelling. It's very compelling. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So yeah, if you're listening, give us a shout on Facebook. Give us a shout on Twitter. Wherever, let us know what you think. I'm curious. And I think there's going to be more uh, of you know kind of mystery style episodes in the future. I find Scooby them really Doo fun. Scooby Doo episodes. Let's call them Scooby Doo episodes. Yeah, you love it. Love it, even though it's kind of a tease because there's no real resolution. But well, it's fun to fun to tease the brain. It gets your brain, yeah. It gets your brain going and whatever. It gets your brain going. Uh, in this day and age. I have a non sequitur. I have two two closing two Kev's closing facts here. Uh, one's not really a fact, more of just an observation that I I was brought to my attention when I was looking for a fact, and uh, okay. I need to share it with you. If I say Pacific Ocean, yes. do you find it funny that every C that comes up in that, those two words, is pronounced differently? Uh, it's funny. 
Yeah. That is funny. Doesn't that make English a hard... Uh, you can understand why English would be a hard language to word, uh, learn. Oh. <laughs> to yeah. word. Uh, because, yeah, like you have one letter and it has three different uh, usages in one yeah. kind of very, you know, Pacific Ocean. For uh, in, in contrast to like, I took uh, Italian in uh, university at one point and they literally, literally start at here's how you pronounce the letters and when you read it you just make those sounds you know with very few exceptions you just make the sounds that the letters are supposed to make the only one is c c is really interesting like ci makes a ch sound like jow right. um right um or uh ch makes like a k sound like but yeah for the other than that, in Italian, you basically just the the letter sounds. You just make those sounds as you read the word, and you can basically get through it. It's it's a fun language in a lot of ways. Huh, interesting. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I got a little fact of my own to oh, spit right there back you at you. Go. <laughs> All right. So here's my closing fact: Walt Disney World is a big place. Canada sure is. It's way bigger. Yep. It in sure fact, is. This nation is so massive with 3.8 million square miles. It's the second largest country coming after Russia at 6.6 million square miles. Uh huh. It's a little bigger than the States, which weighs in at 3.7 million square miles. Uh huh. I can't wait to see where this is going. (laughs) Disney would fit in Canada 81,975 times. A weird little fact, but it's curious too. I always uh, it well, seems like it should fit more. <laughs> I feel what? like there should be like like a quarter million Disneyland's in Canada. What? Yeah, this is a fact that you're presenting us. Yes, with? I love this idea. Eighty-one thousand Walt Disneyland's could fit in Canada. How fucking dumb is that fact? That's, I guess. Dude, how can you not be so excited about this? It's 81,975 Walt Disney Worlds could fit in Canada. I feel like you're doing a bit, and the bit is how fucking bad this fact is. (laughs) Anyhow, that's how we roll around here. I found that fast. You don't find that fascinating? 81,000. Don't you ever like to get, like, do your gazintas? <laughs> like, the earth Can goes you say 81,000 again. <laughs> 81,975. No kidding. Right? That's what I'm talking about. It's like when they're like, you can fit 100 million thousand earths in the sun. Well, you can fit 81,975. Walt Disney World's in Canada. But I don't... Okay, but I've got a reason. All right. Thank so you here's why that's and dumb. goodbye. <laughs> I've got, no. No. I've got a Just reasonable idea of go. how big the world is. I don't really know how big Walt Disney World is. Apparently we'll just fade big. out on me. We'll just fade out on me continuing to argue. <laughs> I think that's probably the best uh, play. <laughs> what a terrible fact. <laughs> that's really <laughs> shitty. <laughs> uh, good times. <laughs> this is killing you. <laughs> what made you go with that? I don't know. I just I was like, you know what? That's kind of fun. I was like, it just was kind of dumb. It was dumb and like, just like, it's like the whole non sequitur thing. It was just a stupid random fact. Like 81,970 Walt Disney Worlds fit in Canada. I've kept expecting that like there'd be some significance to the number. Dude, no. Nothing. It's a dumb fact. Ah. That's what I do. 
Thank you for listening to Fact Smacks. We hope you enjoyed our show. If you want to hear more, be sure to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash facts schmacks. Or you can check us out on Facebook or on YouTube or on twitter.com at fact schmacked pod. We also have a website, factschmacks.xyz, because we know you haven't had enough yet. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>